Hello and welcome to another Tyrrell's Classic Workshop. Uh, this time round we're looking at a car that's been in the workshop uh, and it been in the background in a few videos on a few occasions now and it's been here for some time because we've been getting to grips with some subtle but well some not so subtle problems that have caused this car to not be the sort of beast that it should be for want of a better way of putting it really. This is the Mercedes C126 560 SEC and in the 1980s this was just about as good as it got from Mercedes-Benz. This was their version of King of the Road. And the expression barnstormer, auto barnstormer, really, this was pretty good for a, a four-seater car in the 1980s. This was one of the fastest cars that you could storm the autobahn in with a maximum speed of 155 miles an hour or 156, which is almost bang on 250 kilometers an hour. So it's this car, in spite of the fact that it's a big coupe weighing one and three quarter tons, this car can shift, actually. This is a fast car. Uh, in its day, it did, well, still uh, on a good day, not to 60 and under seven seconds, which again was moving for a, a, a big, heavy coupe. But a great piece of uh, engineering. The 126s lost their way a bit value and desirability wise for some years, but the 560 SEC has always been the one to have. Um, it's not much more thirsty than the, the 380, 420 or 500, but it's considerably more powerful. And this is a Euro spec. This is an original UK right-hand drive car, which means uh, it's not detuned and it, it hasn't got the catalyzed uh, exhaust system, the catalyzed engine. And that means that this is the full, the full deal in terms of power and torque. And this develops 300 brake horsepower from its 5.6 litre V8 engine. So it's quite undertuned really. That's about 47, 48 brake horsepower a litre, which is not a lot, but it does it very reliably. And the thing to bear in mind is this is not some screaming uh, multi camshaft unit. This develops power right from low down, from idle, it pulls really strongly and has a very linear acceleration. So when it changes up to the next gear, for example, when you're accelerating, it doesn't suddenly push you in the back because it's got a, a new uh, lease of life because it was strung, strung, struggling at the top end, as I am struggling to say it. Um, and it was a really flat power curve and that made this car seriously quick, actually, because it wasn't just 300 brake horsepower at 5,500 RPM. It's really building up uh, to that for quite some time before. And that means it's a real mover, this car. I remember on one occasion in the 1980s, around about 1986, 87, I had a, a Ferrari Mondial in for some work, which was uh, probably one of the slowest Ferraris ever built. But nevertheless, a 560 SEL joined the dual carriageway in front of me, saw it was a Ferrari in his uh, mirror, and floored it and there was this puff of black smoke out the back because obviously it had been driven quite gently and he was off down the dual carriageway i couldn't catch him in a ferrari um, that probably okay it's a little bit exceptional but it tells you how fast these actually are they're very fast it's a pillarless coupe which means it's got the party trick with the windows that move up and down and make the b pillar invisible there is no b pillar as such on the car which makes for that with the electric sliding roof makes for almost open air motoring. It's a proper four seater. Mercedes facelifted it and came out with these, would you believe they called them manhole cover alloy wheels? Uh, they didn't call them that in the sales brochure, but that's what they were called internally. And what we've come up against with this car is the fact that it's not been developing anything like full power for quite some time. And uh, it's all right to talk retrospectively now because we've actually finished the job, really. But it just felt flat. The whole car, it just would not accelerate properly. And there was nothing, there was no misfire, nothing tangible that you could tell, but it just was nowhere near um, uh, as fast as it should be. And we've had a, a quite a few issues with this. The fuel injection system was varnished up inside, which meant the curve of the fueling wasn't right. So we've had to take that off. It's had a new set of eight injectors and the exhaust system was really strangulated up. It was like something off a two or 2.5 litre 
uh, car. I mean, if that, it was really a, a pea shooter of an exhaust system that somebody had made up to fit on it. And we managed to have specially made almost original specification exhaust system in all its glory in stainless steel and we'll be able to see that later and the difference between the euro spec 560 and the likes of the us one is is big to the point that this engine breathes much more deeply it develops more power this engine has two induction pipes to let air into the air filter in the engine compartment whereas a US spec 560 only has one because at high revs, high air volumes pumping in and out of the engine, they don't expect it to develop as much power as this one does. So this is 300 brake horsepower. A US spec 560 is about 240, so it's, it's a big difference. As I said, this is, apart from the AMG engined cars, that the wide body AMG cars, which are now highly sought after, not crazy about the body kit myself, but that's just a matter of opinion. Um, but they're well into six figures now, and these are actually climbing in value quite significantly. It took the owner 12 years to find this car because so many of them are so knocked about and, you know, they were made to be driven. They were everyday transport for very wealthy people in their day. So he spent 12 years finding this car, but it just didn't drive well. So we've sorted that, we've brought the driving of the car up to the standard of the rest of the car now. So fuel injection system wasn't working properly. We also found that the throttle linkage uh, wasn't opening. It goes back to uh, something I've talked about before in the videos. It's amazing how many people, you, when you floor the throttle pedal inside the car, it doesn't actually open the uh, throttles on the engine all the way, and it just instantly robs the engine of power. So I've, we've sorted all that linkage out. It's quite a complicated linkage on the engine. And we've got the fuel injection system working properly again, and we've fitted a correct exhaust system. And I'm pretty sure, I haven't given this car a final road test, but I'm pretty sure all those things combined uh, will make a big difference to, uh, to the way this car performs in its back, being its really strong self. So we'll just have a look at some of the jobs we've done and then we'll take the car for a run. Really, really interesting car in Mercedes-Benz history, this, the 560 SEC. Well, we've pulled the air filter off the car now and I've actually already seen that the throttle linkage is not opening all the way which is as i've said before in videos on the ferrari 456 that's a sure way of robbing potential horsepower from the engine is for the the throttle sounds obvious but you'd be surprised how many cars um, it doesn't open it's now opening all the way right down and um, so we're now looking at this area here the fuel injection system this is Bosch K-Jetronic, or Constand Jetronic injection. Bosch very cleverly in the late 60s and early 70s realized that it doesn't actually matter. Modern cars have sequential injection where if a cylinder's about to pull in a charge of air to mix with petrol to uh, combust, you have what's called sequential injection where that injector literally injects it in at the right moment, the psychological moment. But Bosch ascertained that if you have a system where, that's constantly feeding the cylinders, the petrol just sits there and then is sucked in. Um, so that this, this is actually a constant feed of fuel to, the, to every and all cylinders at the same time. Very clever, very simple, very simplistic, but it works. Hence Bosch K for constant in German, Jektronik. But what we have done is we've taken the spark plugs out here. We've done what's called a plug chop. So um, I've road tested the car, I've driven it, I've adjusted the mixture by ear to what I think is optimal. And a lot of the spark plugs are combusting all right. Th this is nice with the, the nose of the plug, a nice pale color and the outside a darkish color. But this one is too rich. The sort of stoichiometrically correct mixture, which on an engine of this age is about 14 to one, 14 parts air to one part petrol, is wrong it's running rich so um, that tells me that we need to take this part off here because it's not giving the right amount of fuel to all the cylinders so we're going to send that off for rebuilding we'll probably send the injectors off as well we'll get them back and see if this car is actually producing its very hefty and very flat torque curve and over 300 brake horsepower 
let's see how we get on with that. Well, it's always tricky chasing a problem such as this car has got, not developing enough power. Uh, it could be more than one problem, and uh, it actually has proved to be the case with this car. The exhaust system that was fitted to it that somebody has cobbled up at some stage really was suitable for a 2.5 litre engine, nothing more. It was very small bore. It had lots of blockages in the system. It really was not fit for purpose. And in fact, although we didn't record it, it made a really loud whooshing, um, screeching noise out of the tailpipes because the exhaust gas was simply uh, trying to get out of the system. Probably, I used to do exhaust back pressure tests. I'm guessing this is, for anybody who's extremely nerdy, about 250, 300 inches water of back pressure on the exhaust system, which was far too much. And you would think, I mean, Mercedes-Benz parts backup has historically been excellent and still is, but they could not supply exhaust parts for this car because it's the, the king of the road uh, in Mercedes terms in the 1980s. Um, it had a king of an exhaust system on it. And in fact, the 560 was exhaust was different to the other C126 systems. They uh, didn't need to flow as much gas, so they were slightly smaller diameter, but the same basic principle. But one of the differences with this system is the manifolds uh, are actually what's called extractor manifolds. So they, they, um, they're sort of uh, V-shaped, better get that right. Um, and um, as one, the exhaust gas comes out of one cylinder, it pulls the gas out of the other cylinder next to it and vice versa. And they end up sort of helping each other to, uh, to come out of the engine and that helps gas flow, hence power. So you had four into two into one on each side of the engine, which is very good for a production car. And it did unleash extra horsepower. And then you got these rather nice bends in the system, this uh, quite cute little first centre box. And then this very extraordinary setup here uh, where it goes into these boxes and then out. And this is replicating the original exhaust system, which is simply not available from Mercedes for the 560 now for the moment. But it is a mother and father of exhaust systems for a production car. And I've been dealing with Paul at a London Stainless Exhaust Centre for a very long time and he's very cleverly made himself the original jigs in the 1980s for, for these exhausts because they were mild steel originally used to rust so you needed to replace them every two three years something of that order so he had a business in stainless steel exhausts and uh, i approached him and he's managed to make as close to an original equipment 560 sec exhaust system as we can get so this is one of the contributing factors to the fact that this car was way down on power. It was never going to perform properly with the old exhaust on it. So we've got this now. Uh, we waited for some time for it to be hand fabricated and we've now fitted it and uh, it just looks so much better and it works so much better than the one that was on it. Well, a little bugbear of mine that I've come across uh, countless times in the last 38-ish years that I've been working on Mercedes like this um, is the steering box adjustment. I mentioned this a while back in my 107 SL video, but very few people, it amazes me, there's an adjustment on the steering box to actually take the, uh, the slack, uh, the free play out of the steering box, which builds up over time. And around about 70,000 miles, they need to be adjusted and it transforms the handling of the car. This car at the moment has done 85,000 miles, so it's, it's ripe for the steering box being adjusted and it's never been done. I can tell that by, by the amount of play in it. So I'm going to adjust that. We actually get at it through a, um, a five millimeter hex key bolt on the top of the steering box, which is locked off by a 19 millimeter lock nut on the outside of it. And it's quite awkward to reach because it's sort of halfway down. It's at the bottom of being able to reach it from the top and it's at the top of being able to reach it from the bottom. So that's probably why people don't bother, but it's worth the effort. So I'm going to adjust the steering box now and you have to make sure there's a compromise. You don't want to over adjust it so it goes stiff, the steering, because it's too, all too clamped together. But you do just want to take the play out of it. And at the moment, there is quite a lot of play in the steering wheel before it actually gets transmitted through the steering box down to the linkage to move the wheels. Well, 
The power steering does take up some of the clearance in the box, but nevertheless, this is well worth doing. Um, so we've adjusted the steering box now. Um, and if I'm, if I'm going to put small inputs into the steering wheel now, and we can actually see the front wheels turning, which is more than they did before. There we go. Steering is much more direct and it's not tight because it's returning to the, the central position nice and freely. That is a result. The car is going to drive much better just for that alone. So now we can finally take it for a run and see if uh, with all the things we've done to it, we found those lost horsepower as well. Well, one of the things that this car is also famous for um, is the, uh, the seat belt butler. Um, and the reason why this, this hump is here is because car manufacturers with pillarless coupes and convertibles found it really difficult to, to station this part of the seat belt properly. Because if it's too low, all it does is actually compress your shoulder, which is very nasty in a front end impact. So they have this hump on them and this rather interesting uh, seat belt butler. Thank you, Jeeves. That will be all. Well, here we are out on our a road test after a lot of work has been done on this car. Uh, <laughs> a large amount of which we haven't been able to video because, you know, on a good day, the business is a living, breathing business. So uh, it's difficult to capture everything while we're actually fixing the cars and going about our everyday stuff as well. But obviously we've, the fuel injection system was varnished up, the throttle wasn't opening all the way, um, the exhaust system was restricting things quite significantly. So um, as I talked about earlier, it's all about how, how deeply these engines can breathe. And this was, um, this was it in the 1980s, the mid to late 80s anyway for Mercedes-Benz. This car was uh, their ultimate, really. Um, and yeah, it's just almost up to working temperature now. The oil will be the same. Um, and the steering wheel already, I can feel, the steering is much more direct. If I just, the slightest movement in the steering wheel before, it would not be as accurate as that at all. Uh, that would be lost motion in the steering box it, and yet it's it's returning it's self-centering which is the sure sign that the steering box is not uh, over adjusted it's not too tight as you can see it's coming straight back into line which is great uh, so that is um, that's a big difference actually it's you know without important connections like the the steering and the accelerator uh, working properly it's all about how these cars are set up. That interrupts the communication between car and driver and vice versa. And the steering wheel is slightly offset now that the box has been tightened up. So we will have to just move the track arms, um, probably, I'm guessing, half a turn each side to move that over just to bring the steering wheel back to there. But that's all part of the process. We just do it one stage at a time. And this really has been a process job. Uh, we found at least three things wrong that were affecting the performance on this car quite markedly. So yeah, process of elimination. We'll just let it continue to warm through and then we'll see if that torque and power is very much in evidence, as it should be. Well, everything's up to speed let's see if that 560 magic is alive and kicking oh yes pulling like a train um, that is absolutely great uh, just there's just loads of torque there um, and uh, the, the, the beauty about this is when it is right, I can't tell you how, how happy I am about that. This has been a real battle to get this car right. Um, it's thrown various curveballs at us. But to actually save this car, yeah, it's not the fastest car on the planet. You know, I mean, 100, 155 miles an hour. It's not amazingly fast by modern car standards, but in its day for a 1980s four-seater, 
that was able to safely do 155 miles an hour this was moving and, th and this car has got a lovely power curve um, and uh, we are stuck behind um, a slightly slower vehicle <coughs> at the moment so I'm going to just try that acceleration now look at that uh, it's so funny when you when you back off the throttle in this car the front of the car goes down and it, it sort of pushes you pushes you forward uh, it's it's very easy to underestimate the uh, the pulling power of this um, I'll just do that again while we've got a clear road Yeah, it's it's um, just a very fat, flat torque curve. It's not about peakiness. Um, 340 pounds per foot of torque at uh, 3,500 RPM, and then 250 at 4,000 at 4,500. It's a very flat torque curve, very linear. Develops lots of torque from low revs. Um, that's difficult to make it accelerate without it actually shifting down to another gear as it's supposed to but um, you can feel that torque that push back in the seat um, from low revs again as it should be I mean the 560 should be a, a very quick car even now um, and uh, even at the top end it's still pulling strongly up to 6,000 rpm a flat power curve as well the torque curve and the power curve um, interact beautifully. Mercedes really knew what they were doing with this engine. They really did. Yeah, it's the mark of a very well-developed engine that the, the power is so linear. It's torque almost from idle right the way through and melding with the perfect power curve higher up, right up to the 6,000 RPM red line. It's, it's just got big lungs, this car. When they can actually be filled, it's a very impressive and satisfying car and it's almost got limousine like I mean it's it's very similar under the skin obviously the body design is different but it's very similar to the 560 SEL the saloon counterpart the long wheelbase Mercedes saloon which was used by heads of state and was um, dare I say it a 1980s status symbol as well and um, Hence the fact it's got a very smooth ride handling setup for the suspension and very quiet. You just can't hear the engine even though there's not a lot of road noise. You can't hear the engine at all. It's just ambling along here at uh, 1500 RPM. Um, a very, very quiet car uh, inside this. I'm not raising my voice talking. Um, it, it is uh, a very, very resolved you can see where the the development money that was spent on this car went you know mercedes did not skimp uh on this car at all the the w140 the s-class that came afterwards mercedes got wrong partly because they went up a cul-de-sac but partly because of the world around them at that time they developed a sort of super large slab-sided luxo barge with big engines big V12 of course the first uh, production Mercedes V12 um, and the world just didn't didn't really want that sort of car at that time uh, so yeah a, a status symbol and a technological tour de force but slightly out of rhythm with what was happening in the world whereas this car was really on point it sold very well the 560 and one of the reasons is because of that huge power just fantastic it just literally lifts the whole car it's got that much that much grunt the whole car just lifts and is away quite extraordinary and this is a fast car 155 miles an hour 156 just nudging 250 kmh so that uh, people in the 80s could drive along the autobahns in these at full whack at nigh on 250 clicks for a long time that was what they were engineered for and 0 to 60 in under seven seconds, which for a one and three quarter ton car was moving in the 80s, particularly a full four seater. And one of the things about this car, it is 10% lighter than the previous S-Class Mercedes. 
and that's why even though it doesn't have the the torque of the 450 SEL 6.9 the predecessor the sort of ultimate Merc it's still faster because of the aerodynamics and the lighter weight than the 6.9 was interesting car indeed well this is very satisfying this is a lovely example of the uh, the C126 560 SEC almost a, if you will a sweet spot um, Euro spec uh, immaculate condition, known mileage and provenance and uh, right colour but also now having sorted everything out able to deliver the goods as well uh, yeah I think the owner is going to be very very happy with this car and we have a clear road ahead of us what more to say than there it is 5.6 litres of Mercedes-Benz excellence. Nothing more to be said, in which case I shall say that concludes another Tyrrell's Classic Workshop video and we will be back with something else very soon.